Everything I was listening to was dark, it was hard driven, it was based upon hate, war, death, pain. That's all my music, all of my movies that I watched. He was also in the black arts. He was teaching other kids and other people about being in the black arts and about witchcraft. My bedroom was an array of the darker side of the occult, such as the Necronomicon, the Satanic Bible. I had upside down crosses. I had broken shards of glass laying about in the corner. I had hooks and metal cables wrapped around, looking like a Hellraiser. Do you ever find yourself unable to sleep, thinking about the proverbial monsters under the bed? The things that haunt us, witches and warlocks, vampires and demons. As the nights get longer and the winter closes in, I can't help thinking about the cases that scare me, that leave me shivering in the night. Tonight's case involves blood, the dark arts, and a seemingly charismatic leader who convinced his peers turned disciples to join him on a mission that would ruin more lives than one. Tonight, we're traveling across the southern United States, from Kentucky to Florida to Louisiana, alongside a group of teenagers who believed they were part of a vampire cult, led by a boy who believed himself immortal. Hello, and welcome to True Crime Daily After Dark a podcast that dives into some of the darkest and most shocking true crime stories. This podcast will immerse you in a world where we can only wish that what we hear is fiction. I'm your host, Olivia Owens. In this episode, we're looking at the case of Roderick Farrell, a teen from Kentucky who became absolutely convinced he was actually a vampire and the heinous crime he committed not long after drinking a new recruit's blood. He didn't feel like a part of the mundane world of his hometown, so he created his own, only to be brought back to reality by a punishment no one would envy. Murray, Kentucky is a college town in the southwestern part of the state nearly spinning distance from the Tennessee border and about two hours from Nashville. It's a city proud of its history and its local sports teams. It's also the home of a teen killer. Roderick Rod Farrell grew up in Murray with his mom, Sandra Gibson, who was only 16 when she had him. His dad was out of the picture and only showed up on certain occasions. Sandra had many relationships over the years and even a brief second marriage. They moved around a lot, and Sandra struggled to keep a job. She allegedly worked as an exotic dancer and sex worker to get by. Sandra had her own fascination with the dark arts, and since it was just the two of them, she would share this fascination with her son. The two bonded over vampire movies and video games. Little did she know just how deep Rod would take this obsession. He came of age in the early 90s, around the same time as the Rodney King riots, the reunification of former Soviet states, the O.J. Simpson trial, and the birth of the Internet. The world seemed chaotic and dark. A young Rod dug into this darkness. He started experimenting first with sex and drugs. Then, he started cutting himself, leaving his mom, Sandra, feeling helpless. In one instance, he said he cut himself from gut to gullet. Even his music taste turned macabre. Then, things slowly started taking a turn for the worse. He killed some neighborhood cats using weapons that he owned. He became infatuated with vampires, and he started to act the part. He was naturally slender, with shoulder-length, straight, dark hair and pale skin. He became convinced that he was a 500-year-old vampire named Vesigo. I 
tried to actually embrace the lifestyle of being a vampire. And being so young, my mind latched onto it so deeply, so tenaciously, that I got lost inside of it. After that, he couldn't keep his interest in the dark arts to himself. He began to tell his friends about the worlds he inhabited and his immortal nature. Three peers, Scott Anderson, Dana Cooper, and Charity Casey would become his confidants. And then, his followers. They would each take part in an initiation ritual at a cemetery where they would drink each other's blood. They called it crossing over. But their vampire world would soon collide with the real one. They lived in the heart of rural Kentucky, a central part of the nation's Bible Belt with a conservative majority and a religious populace. So they planned to leave and head south to New Orleans. In November 1996, Rod, Charity, Scott, and Dana left Murray, Kentucky and started driving south towards Florida in order to pick up a new recruit. Her name was Heather Wendorf. Heather and Rod had met in Eustis, Florida, a year prior when Rod briefly moved there with his mother. The two became instant friends, and she was more than ready to join his vampire gang. They planned to return to Murray, where Rod felt comfortable with his self-described power base. Heather allegedly told Rod that her dad was mistreating her and her mom was doing nothing about it. Rod sympathized with her situation. He, too, had allegedly been abused by his family members when he was young. On the way to Eustace, Rod's car began to break down. By the time they arrived, it had become virtually undrivable. This was just a minor problem since he knew Heather's parents had a Ford Explorer that they could steal. When they arrived in Eustace, they met Heather down the road from her house and brought her immediately to a local cemetery for her initiation ceremony. Once there, he performed the rite of passage, the crossing over. Heather was now officially a member of Rod's vampire cult. In order to continue on their way, Rod and his crew needed a car, Stat. Heather offered up her parents' Ford Explorer and said Rod could take the keys, which were in her parents' bedroom. She even left the garage door unlocked for easy access into her home. Before venturing into their home, Rod took acid and other drugs. Charity, Heather, and Dana drove Scott and Rod to Heather's home, and the two teen boys got out, preparing to sneak in and snatch the keys. But things didn't go as planned, and chaos would unfold. November 25th, 1996. It was around 9 p.m. when everything changed for Rod Farrell and his five followers. Heather Wendorf had left open her garage door so Rod and Scott could enter and steal her parents' keys. This was so that they could continue on their journey south to New Orleans. But things wouldn't go as planned. The group of teens went to Heather's home where Rod and one of the other members, Scott Anderson, prepared to steal Heather's parents' car. We had sticks, basically just wooden sticks in our hands. I didn't know how big her father was, and I was slightly worried about that, and I knew a grown man could smash me to the ground. Rod saw a crowbar in the garage and believed it would be the best tool to defend himself if necessary. Phil Chalmers, Crime Watch Daily special correspondent, speaks with Rod. Did Heather ask you to kill her parents? She had said something about, if I asked you, would you kill my parents? I figured it was just a joke. I'm like, sure. But what happened was hardly a joke. 
Rod Farrell and Scott Anderson made their way through Richard Wendolph and Naoma Ruth Queen's home on the lookout for the car keys. Richard, Heather's dad, was asleep on the couch. They snuck around the house looking for the correct bedroom so they could grab the keys and run. But the mission was turning out to be much more difficult than expected. I snapped. I lost full control of myself. Richard, Heather's dad, was asleep on the couch. Rod took his crowbar and hit Richard Wendolph. Over and over, until he was dead. Do you realize I just killed somebody? It wasn't fully set in, and it was and it wasn't. Scott Anderson just stared in disbelief. He stood frozen, stock still. He was scared to death. He had never seen anything like that. Never seen a death, never seen even really any extreme violence. He was stunned. But the bloodbath inside the Wendorf home wasn't over just yet. Naoma walked into the room wearing a robe and holding a cup of coffee. That's when she saw her husband, horrifically beaten to death, on the couch. Everything went in a blur at that time. She basically asked me, she's like, who are you? And I told her, run, get out of here. Or at least I thought I did. And instead, she charged at me and flung the coffee in my face. The next thing I know, I've taken her down to the ground and I've beaten her to death. I am just sort of getting the grasp that I just killed this man over here. Now I've just killed his wife. What just happened? How did I even get here? Rod and Scott eventually found the master bedroom, stole a pearl necklace and a hunting knife, and grabbed the car keys. They rushed out of the home and drove off to collect the three ladies. Soon after Rod and Scott left, Heather's sister Jennifer came home to discover the bloodbath. My mother and my father have just been killed. What makes you think that they have been killed? Yeah. There is blood everywhere. Please, it's fast. Nobody's there with you. I don't know where my sister is. She's only 15 years old, and she's gone. And it's gone. Okay, we're on the way. Meanwhile, Rod, Scott, Heather, Charity, and Dana escaped in the Wendolph's Ford Explorer, taking steps to avoid detection. Rod swapped the Explorer's license plates with Scott's car as they fled, but police eventually located Scott's car with Richard and Naoma's license plate on it and honed in on who they were looking for. Instead of going back to Kentucky, Rod and his crew made their way to the city of New Orleans. Rod threw the crowbar and other evidence in the Mississippi River and changed out of his blood-soaked clothes at a gas station, trying to get rid of any and all proof of his connection to the crime. However, their road trip to New Orleans was not seamless. Police would pull over the Ford Explorer five times five times, yet they managed to evade arrest. So how could you be stopped five times and not arrested? They were expecting a teenage cult-leading psychopath, and instead I was speaking to them with every courtesy. Due to these repeated interactions with officials, the teens opted not to stay in New Orleans and to head to Baton Rouge, Louisiana instead. That's when everything changed. Charity, Rod's girlfriend, decided to call her family from a payphone to ask for money. Her family agreed to meet her at a motel in Baton Rouge with cash. It was after that phone call that everything began to spiral out of Rod's control. Charity's family contacted police, and officers descended upon the motel and arrested all five teens. Rod's recruiting mission had come to a sudden end. At the police station, while awaiting their extradition to Florida, surveillance cameras showed Rod and girlfriend Charity passionately kissing in their holding cell. The events that had transpired just days and even hours earlier didn't seem to phase the couple. Rod's actions and the arrest became a media sensation. Cameras followed them News stations got their footage, 
and it became a major news story. I figured I was a dead man, for real because I knew if at that point any of us got caught, it was going to be the electric chair. Rod milked it for all it was worth, but he claims he did that for a reason. It just struck me, I'm like, they're all here because of murder. They're just here for the ripe amusement, the entertainment that this murder's bringing people. And when I found out about the sensationalism, I was like, okay, it's working. They're looking at me and not these other people. They're not going to look at them as monsters. They're going to see me as the monster, and that'll help them. Detectives honed in on Rod's four disciples, trying to see who knew what about Rod's plans to kill Naoma and Richard. Heather insisted she didn't know about Rod's plans to kill her parents and said she never wanted them dead in the first place. Here's footage of her discussion with detectives. I remember telling them flat out, don't even go near my parents. Why would you tell him not even to go near your parents? Because he asked me not too long ago if I wanted my parents dead or alive, and I said straight out I wanted them alive. Heather apparently didn't even know her parents were dead until they were on their way to New Orleans from Florida. Heather maintained her innocence, but the other teens were beginning to crack. Charity told detectives she knew Rod planned on killing Richard and Naoma Wendorf, but tried telling Rod and Scott not to go through with it. Dana corroborated Charity's story, which you can hear in this clip. She refers to Charity as Shea. You don't hear us say we're going to kill the parents? I heard Rod say it. Scott just nodded his head and went with Rod. Me and Shea did try to convince them not to do it, but... Not to do what? Not to kill her, to kill her parents. What was your reaction to that? They was like, well, there's no other way. It was like talking to a brick wall. Scott Anderson didn't hide his actions either. So your intentions were to go up there and assist him in that? Yes. And how were you going to assist? He was going to go after the father and I was going to go after the mother. <clears throat> but then when I saw him make the first blow, I knew I could They had confessed. Then, it was time to face charges. A grand jury decided not to charge Heather Wendorf, deciding she had no part in the planning and death of her parents. Dana Cooper and Charity Casey both went to prison on charges of third-degree murder, robbery with a deadly weapon, and armed burglary. Charity was released in 2006 and Dana in 2011. Scott Anderson pleaded guilty to first-degree murder and was sentenced to life in prison. In 2018, a judge lowered his sentence to 40 years. He will get out in 2032 when he is 51 years old. Rod Farrell's case went to trial, but he shocked the nation by pleading guilty to killing Richard and Naoma Wendorf, as well as armed burglary and robbery with a deadly weapon. He hoped the guilty plea would prevent him from getting the death penalty. However, a Supreme Court decision ruled that any juvenile with life sentences must be retried. So, he would go back to court. He had high hopes for himself and believed he could get out early. He told Crime Watch Daily in 2016. I have a house, I have a woman, I have a job waiting on me. I even have a cat and a dog waiting. But the Wendorf family and the rest of the world can breathe easy. Because in April 2020, a judge resentenced Rod to life in prison, calling the former vampire teen killer irreparably corrupt. And so, there's no chance Rod will be seeing the world outside his Florida prison anytime soon and no future for what was once known as the Vampire Clan of Murray, Kentucky. Thank you for tuning in to this episode of True Crime Daily After Dark, where we learned about Rod Farrell, a young man who believed himself a vampire, inspiring others to follow him on a trail of death and destruction. If you like what you hear, be sure to tune in to all of our other episodes and subscribe. I'm your host, Olivia Owens, and with that, 
It's time to turn out the lights. <laughs>